Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. Mining Weekly Editor Martin Kremer joins me today to unpack the latest news in the mining industry. Welcome, Martin. Thanks, Ashley. Now, to start off, platinum may see a deficit of more than a million ounces because of significant demand. Can you tell us more? You know, this is the irony of the platinum sector. Where else do you get very robust demand, but bad pricing? I mean, it shouldn't exist in the world. So it's a bit of an enigma. And so people who have started studying it say that the sentiment has changed. You know, the pricing used to be based on fundamentals going up to about 2010 and just beyond. But now a sentiment is added owing to, you know, the expectation that there will be different energy systems, that there will be different mobility for vehicles. And this has caused a sort of a marking of time where even though they say, yes, we want the platinum, they don't actually buy it at a level that lifts the price. They're hoping that because you've now got this massive deficit building beyond a million ounces, that it just has to change. But it'll be interesting to see how quickly it changes, because I would like to see a much more in-depth analysis of this. You know, the exchanges that reflect this price, these prices, the platinum price, they should be looking at those exchanges. Why is there not proper activity there? You know, I know it's not as huge as gold, but it's a very important investment for us. You know, should it be in the United States or should it be in Europe or should or maybe should there be a competitive exchange in China? China is the biggest user. And it would be interesting to start focusing on those exchanges because we once got input from a deep analysis done in Australia. And they said, we crazy the way we are running this. And uh, we know that certain people have called for a look at the exchanges because it's just something that needs to be carefully examined in the case that it is holding back price lifting. Can you tell us why development finance institutions are seen as key architects of the hydrogen economy? So we're again linked to platinum. You've got this green hydrogen economy that will be the driver of future demand. We see change in mobility for years and years and years. Platinum group metals were the mainstay of autocatalysis. You know, they made sure that the fumes from the exhausts of vehicles did not pollute the world's big cities. And so there was a constant uh, flow there. All of a sudden, you've now got other markets opening up because you need to protect the planet. And one of the materials that is key, and I don't think it can be competed with, is, is green hydrogen. So to start a new industry is difficult. And that's why you have to have the finance the development finance institutions coming in, not only providing finance, trying to influence policy, try to influence the technology. And these finance institutions are now doing that. And as they step into that space, you find the private sector banks then get more encouraged. They then also want to fund. But it's that old chicken and egg, you know, what is going to come first? And in this instance, it's got to be infrastructure. You've got to have those electrolyzers. They've got to be funded. You've got to have the fuel cells built in the cars. And these fuel cells are not only in cars, as I stated, but they also are stationary power plants. So you can have them in remote areas. It is the way to go because it does the uh, steel. It cleans up the steel. It cleans up the cement. It cleans up every big part of big industry. And you can see that in Europe just about every day now, you know, there's a new announcement that uh, there's going to be a hydrogen facility, green hydrogen, always specifying green hydrogen, which suits South Africa so much because we've got the sun and the wind that can actually form a nice basis to the renewable energy that can then create the green hydrogen. And then the fuel cells can turn that green hydrogen into very clean electricity, which the world must have. And lastly, infrastructure investments is a must for economic growth and job creation. You know, properly implemented infrastructure in South Africa will be a very substantial economic and larger. 
it's going to provide rewards for an economy long after the roads are built, the railways are improved, the bridges are done, the energy is restored, water and sanitation, telecommunications, aviation, health, and many more public structures have been built. It will be helping the economy. It is the way to go to create growth, you know, to create jobs. And South Africa is in a very good position because the pervasive existing but often very badly damaged infrastructure needs to be rehabilitated. And this presents a greater likelihood of near-term financial backing being received from a combination of not only development finance institutes, but also the private sector. And that's a major advantage. We've, it, it's a disadvantage at this stage because we've got potholed roads and we've got all uh, ports that aren't working and railways that aren't working. But those tracks are there. Those ports are there. Those roads are there to actually quickly now take the decisions to rebuild them is going to stimulate the economy very quickly. It's going to create the growth because when you get those roads up and up, it a, has a multiply effect. When you get the ports going, it brings in more foreign exchange. There are so many things that happen with infrastructure. So I think financial institutions must be alerted to the public domain commitment of South Africa's new multi-party unity government to build a world that is fair, just, inclusive, and prosperous. So development banks must be constantly reminded of their developmental mandate and their need to perform in a manner that ensures that private investment is also made to flow where it is needed. And in this case, repairing what has been damaged will stimulate this economy and it can be done quickly and it must be done. Thanks for speaking with us, Martin. It's a great pleasure, Sashni. That's it for today. Join us again next week for more news analysis on the local and global mining industries. Don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Mining Weekly daily email newsletter.